The provincial resort German town of Furstenberg, located about 100 km northeast of Berlin, is almost unremarkable. However, this almost is what precisely makes it special. The fact is that during the Second World War, the Ravensburg concentration camp was located here, named after the local suburban village. The camp was founded in 1939. Initially, German women who disgraced the nation were exiled here. Among others, these were women who had committed criminal offenses or held political views contrary to Hitler's regime, such as communists, leftists, and anyone who was simply not careful enough to criticize the Fuhrer and the Nazis. Later, groups of Jewish, Gypsy, Polish, and other representatives of what the Germans considered inferior peoples began to be sent here. In 1940, Himmler visited this concentration camp and ordered the introduction of physical punishment for the imprisoned women and children. The concentration camp was reinforced with new personnel, so German wardens of both genders who were dedicated to the ideas of National Socialism were sent here. Moreover, in Ravensburg a special school was created to train guards for other women's camps. So Ravensburg quickly turned not only into one of the most terrible concentration camps of Hitler's Germany, but also into a supplier of personnel for other similar institutions of German Nazism. Arrival When a batch of prisoners arrived at the camp, they were stripped naked right on the street. Summer or winter, it didn't matter. Prisoners also shaved their heads here. Then a medical examination, sorting and selection were carried out for further distribution to barracks and other facilities. After which the prisoners were sent to the bathhouse. During the bathing procedure, the guards made sure that the prisoners did not stay longer than 10-15 minutes. But young and pretty girls and women could be detained for an hour and even more. At this time, the bathhouse barracks were visited by male guards and camp authorities. The surviving prisoners didn't like to remember what was happening there. Camp order. The camp schedule was strict and the guards monitored its observance meticulously. The rise was at 3.30 in the morning, which in fact was still night. Breakfast was half a mug of surrogate coffee and boiled potatoes. Prisoners were lucky if it was not rotten. Bread was not included. Then it was formation, roll call and departure for work that lasted up to 7 hours. Lunch was only 30 minutes and included boiled sweet and ladle of gruel with potato peelings. Then it was formation and roll call from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. Work in summer lasted before dusk, and in winter up to 8-9 p.m. In general, the working day lasted 14 hours. Supper included half a cup of surrogate coffee and 150 grams of bread, which was given only in the evening once a day. On Saturday, prisoners could have a piece of processed cheese, a tablespoon of some kind of a syrup, and 50 grams of margarine. In addition to women, there were also children in the camp who were kept apart from their mothers. Many were orphans. Prisoner of Ravensburg Elizaveta Nikolaevna Novitskaya recalled, The assessment used sticks to drive a crowd of women and children aged 3 to 5 years old past our barracks. The children were brought to an empty barracks. Women, mothers, were rushing to their children. The children were screaming. The guards, sparing no efforts, worked with whips and clubs and then released the dogs. Suddenly, a boy of about five jumped out of the barrack window and ran to his mother. The wardress struck him with a whip. The boy fell, then got to his knees and still crawled towards his mother. The wardress ran up to the child and began to kick him and beat him until he calmed down. The boy was already lying motionless, but she continued to kick. As it became known later, the mother of these children were taken to another camp and the children were left behind. We helped the kids as best as we could. We gave them a slice of bread, a potato, and a sewed toys from rags. After liberation, many women adopted the surviving children. One day in the fall of 1943, a group of Jewish women were brought to the camp. They were placed in one barracks and locked for several days without water or food. Prisoners were strictly forbidden to approach the barracks. Five days later, half-dead people were thrown into trucks like logs and taken towards the crematorium. The crematorium in Ravensburg began operating in 1943. At first, these were self-made primitive stoves, but in 1944 specialized, so to say, branded installations for burning people were installed. Women had to do all the hardest work, carry bags of raw sand and gravel, stones and logs. Many could not stand it and fell dead right during work or during construction. How did people survive? It would seem that surviving in such conditions is simply impossible. But people somehow managed to stay alive. Soviet women brought a special flavor to camp life. 
Usually they were prisoners of war, civilians sent from occupied territories for any offense, such as for example avoiding deportation to Germany or because of a communist husband. The first prisoners from the USSR arrived at the camp in February 1943. When the Soviet women arrived, they began to sing songs, which stunned the camp authorities. But then it sparked a rage. After each chant, the brutal guards burst into the barracks and began beating everyone. In the barracks, there were bunks of three floors, on which instead of mattresses, there were burlap stuffed with shavings or straw, and the same were pillows. People improved their meager life as best they could. They tried to keep the barracks clean, but overcrowding still had a negative impact. Of course, in addition to hard work, there were various other lighter duties in the camp. For example, sorting things taken away from newly arriving prisoners, cleaning the interior and the residential apartments of concentration camp guards and employees, work in the kitchen, etc. People who end up in such jobs were clearly lucky compared to other prisoners. However, this did not relieve them from punishment for any crime, as well as from gas chamber and from crematorium. Other work and experiments. Young and healthy concentration camp prisoners were also forced into prostitution. They served prison staff and local police activists. Groups were recruited to serve other concentration camps as well. The conditions of women engaged in sexual services was of course much better than the rest. They were fed reasonably well and provided with timely medical examinations. However, women had to go through all this, exploiting their own bodies and health. Such prisoners were usually sterilized. And the standards for providing services were not modest. Six, seven hundred clients per month. It can be said that those women who, due to their appearance, ended up in field brothels from the concentration camp were relatively lucky. But this was the privilege of German, French women and other immigrants from Western European countries. Their chance of survival increased. If this, of course, can be considered luck. The most terrible fate befell women and children who were subjected to monstrous medical experiments. First of all, this concerned Jews, Gypsy, Slavic women and their children. Professor Karl Gebhardt conducted experiments on the fusion of bones, tendons, muscles, and the healing of cut and lacerated wounds. To do this, he cut open the legs, arms, and cavities of healthy people, mostly women and children, and tested his treatment methods on them. Gynecologist Karl Klauberg conducted experiments to create quick and reliable methods of sterilization. For his experiments, he also used not only adult women, but also girls from 10 years old. The prisoners remembered the names of Dr. Percy Trite and head nurse Elizabeth Marshall, who worked in the camp hospital. These sadists joked when they made people disabled. And the disabled in the camp had only one end, the crematorium ovens. Elizabeth Marshall was a woman of about 60 with a good natured smile face. And with such an expression on her face, she starved children and forbade the sick to change purulent bandages. Those suffering from pneumonia were exposed to the street in the rain or snow. It is simply amazing how under such conditions people, prisoners, retained human qualities. They showed compassion for each other, provided mutual assistance and support. In other words, prisoners remained human even in the most inhumane conditions. The same cannot be said about their jailers. In addition to Ravensburg, there were also women's section in Auschwitz and other camps. In the Auschwitz camp system, the women's and children's section were perhaps the largest. The situation of women in Auschwitz was practically the same as in Ravensburg. No food, hard, exhausting work, discipline with sticks with cruel and arrogant wardens, and high mortality. The leadership of the concentration camps of Hitler's Germany successfully carried out the instruction of the Nazis' elite to humiliate and destroy people that were inferior in their opinion. The lifespan of women in concentration camp conditions was as a rule half as long as that of men. Basically, it took from one and a half to two months. In total, 153,000 prisoners passed through Ravensburg according to registration data. From 80 to 90,000 of them died. Most likely this data is not complete, but even these numbers could make anyone feel uneasy. Camp at Auschwitz was liberated by the Red Army in January 1945 and Ravensburg in April 1945. At the side of the camp, a military hospital and rehabilitation center was established for Nazi victims, where the best local doctors worked. 